the physical world itself bears witness. God has given the world itself the knowledge and the greater knowledge that we have of the world when we look at the mitochondria, when we look at the chromosomes, when we look at the physical makeup of the human body and the glorious manner to how it works, when we look at the animals themselves, when we look at a fire flyer, when we look at the animals in the sea, how that you can have fish swim at the greatness of the depths of the ocean and do not be crushed by the weight of the water. When we look at the stars in the sky, my God, look at these things. All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Romans. Now, the last time we were here, we were getting chapter one as we opened up Paul's epistle, as he introduces himself as an apostle, even namely an apostle to the Gentiles and his desire to come to Rome, that he might give them some spiritual benefit as an apostle, bestow upon them a spiritual benefit and be spiritually benefited from those who are in Rome. And Paul expressed to them how he desired to come to them, but he was not able to come to them. He was prevented by something that Paul did not say exactly what it was. But nevertheless, he had great desire to come to those in Rome that he might have spiritual fruit among those Gentiles in Rome, just like as other Gentiles. And then he went to the point and that he was not ashamed of his apostolic duties to preach the gospel. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that it is the power of God unto salvation and that he began to talk about how God's uh, revealed plan of salvation, uh, that is by grace through faith, that is faith in the person and works of Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus and Jesus alone, this was God's plan of salvation. And thus he kind of ends in that. He said, I'm not ashamed of that because in this is the power of God to salvation. So with all of that, we don't want to prolong the time with that because eight, uh, the remaining verses will consume a lot of time and we want to get to these uh, point of chapter one. We want to deal with it didactively and take our time with it. But in dealing with the sense of the gospel, why God's plan of salvation through faith, Paul says he's not ashamed of that, why it is the power of God, we see that as we get into verse 18, Paul is going to talk about sin and the idea, let me make it clear to you, in that God can only save by faith, that is, by a person believing in the person, Jesus is God, he is also Messiah, who came in the flesh, works of Jesus, that he died on the cross, resurrected from the dead, and paying the penalty for our sin. God can only grant salvation in this manner because all have sinned. And who has sinned? This particular section that we're about to get to here. The Gentiles have sinned as he deals, he opens up firstly broadly with humanity and that is man knowing of God and God's righteousness, but of God in particular, rejecting God and thus being engrossed in sin, even sin by the judgment of God. We'll talk about all of that as we get into the text, but being engrossed in sin and thus chapter two, and I know I'm supposed to get into chapter two, but I'm trying to give you an explanation to the end of chapter one, one in 16 and 17. God being of no respect of person, it doesn't matter whether it's the Gentiles 18 through 32 that we are about to talk about or the Jews in chapter two, they also being given even more explicit revelation of God's person and God's law. Even they too have sinned to say whether Gentile or Jew, chapter 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if all have sinned, how can anyone be declared righteous? 
How can anyone be saved? Or in other words, knowing that all of us have lived a sinful manner in some form or another, to some degree or another, how can any of us be declared righteous before God on the basis of works, on the basis of how we lived? Therefore, the beauty, therefore, the necessity of the plan of God to save us not by what we do, because if we look at what we do, we find sin, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, we find sin, but God has to save us in accordance to what we believe, whom we believe upon Jesus Christ and his finished work upon the cross, his resurrection from the dead. Thus God saves us by faith. Why? In any other means, there will be sin. And what happens? The wages of sin is death. Okay, but anyway. Okay, so that's the idea. But, okay. So thus, stemming from, now let's get into this. Stemming from chapter one, that section dealing with the gospel, God has given the gospel, we see sin. And here's where Paul talks about, that's why God has to save by faith uh, in Jesus Christ alone. It's because of sin. 18. So now let's get into that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. Okay, so now he gets into the whole issue of sin. And that is sin in the sense. And now notice what I'm about to say here in the singular sense of the rejection of the true God, the rejection of true God. What? And so, okay, let, let me just deal with the verse and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Because as we work our way through all of this text, you are going to see the sin singular is knowing God and yet rejecting him. They don't want God, refusing God. And then you'll see the adaptation of other gods or idol gods, okay? And God in response to these things. But the singular sin here, rejection of the true God, right? But anyway, the wrath of God is revealed. And the word that he's saying here for reveal, apocalyptita, is in the present sense. Now, as we work through this particular text, we're going to be dealing with, I wouldn't say an inordinate, inordinate amount of Greek, but we will be dealing with a good amount of Greek so that we can understand what God, what Paul is trying to say in the text. So we can see the dynamics and the emphasis of the text. And so the emphasis here is the word here that is being used, apocalyptita, it is a present tense word, and that is the wrath of God is not revealed in finality. You can understand it, and if I had to say it, present passive, but we're not going to get enamored in Greek grammar, but the sense of ongoing. The wrath of God is being revealed. The wrath of God is continually to be revealed. It is continually coming upon a world that rejects God, upon a people that rejects God. And that's the idea. So now let's go. Wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men. And notice, because in, in their rejection of God, it is simply what? A manifestation of their ungodliness, a manifestation of their unrighteousness because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What is the truth that they are suppressing? 19, that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. God is what they are suppressing, the knowledge of God, the knowledge that there is a creator, God of heaven and earth. And what are they doing? 
They know these things and they are suppressing them. They don't want it to be a God. They don't want the knowledge of God to be known to be in all of the world. What is it? The knowledge of God fills the whole world like the waters cover the sea. They don't want this thing. But let's go back to the point. The knowledge, because that which is known about God. Now, here's what I wanted us to, to take a look at is evident within them. What? Diati ta no stone to theu. Because the knowledge of God, phoneron, evident or manifest, esteem in our toys. Evident or manifest, and here's the key, in our toys. Within them, that is to say, within each and every human being, here is a principal truth, is the knowledge of God. And such as it was with them in the ancient times that Paul is giving reference here, it is also true within us. The light of God, we also see that in John chapter 1, is in every man. But what is the problem? Notice, they are suppressing that truth. And let's look at the end of that verse before I uh, uh, d disentangle it. For God made it evident to them. What? God himself made the knowledge of his existence in every man. Intrinsically, within every human being is a knowledge of God. That knowledge is, is not an intimate and expansive knowledge of God, but it is a rudimentary fact that there is a God. And how do I know implanted in every man is a knowledge that God exists? That's what the last part, for God made it evident, for God manifested it to them. And what did God manifest to them? What? The knowledge, what is known about God. He manifested the knowledge of his person. So the first thing that we see is number one, the great sin, the great ungodliness, unrighteousness that is talking about of men is what? The rejection of God. That is the sin. God exists but men reject and even go as so far to suppress the knowledge of God. And even in their suppression, what God has still made himself known to them internally. So the first thing that we see, so let me make a strong point that Paul is making here. God has made himself known internally. God has made himself known internally to every man. The light of God is in every man. That's why there is no such thing as true atheism. That's why there is no such thing as agnosticism. When men say that there is no God, because you're saying that somehow you have attained perfect knowledge of all things in the universe that you know that there is no God. Okay, I guess you're God if you know all of that atheism, that there is no God. Or you're saying, well, I don't know. I cannot say whether there is or whether there is not a God. That is agnosticism. I don't know. That also is a lie. Why? For the scripture says God has revealed it within them. Inside of every man is the knowledge that there is a God. And I say let God be true and let every man be a liar. No man can say there is no God. We know why, because God has made it evident, but anyway, in them, inside of them, but internal evidence. All right, let's keep going. Verse number 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. 
Now let's go to the second point that he's trying to make. Notice now he starts to talk about the created, the physical universe himself. What? The physical universe testifies that it is a God. Notice the creation of the world speaks of his what? Invisible attributes. What attributes of God does it speak of? The eternal power, the greatness of his power. I like that. I like that. The divine nature, the superiority, the greatness of God, the created universe. When you look at the world itself, when you look at the stars in the sky and all, oh my God. When you look at the physical world itself, the intricacies of the world, the, the greater the knowledge that we have of things in this world, science, the greater science, true science will only bear witness that there is a God. And that's what Paul is saying here. The physical world itself bears witness. God has given the world itself the knowledge and the greater knowledge that we have of the world. When we look at the mitochondria, when we look at the chromosomes, when we look at the physical makeup of the human body and the glorious manner to how it works, when we look at the animals themselves, when we look at a fire flyer, when we look at the animals in the sea, how that you can have fish swim at the greatness of the depths of the ocean and do not be crushed by the weight of the water. When we look at the stars in the sky, when we look at the galaxies and the universe, it, we can't look at all of the universe because of the expansion of the universe, but we have all of these satellites and telescopes that show us galaxies and stars. And we say that it's billions and billions and billions of miles stretched so far and so great that we can't measure in miles or kilometers. We have to measure in light years and the time that light has to move from one point to another because of the greatness of these things and the dynamics and the, my God, look at these things. The world itself testifies by the order of creation itself, how the world has a distance from the sun. And if our planet was further away from the sun, life would freeze up. Things would begin to die. If our world was closer to the sun, things would burn up. Life would become insufferable. Life would die. The orderness of creation itself, how the moon, causes the waves of the waters of the oceans to rise and to fall. How all of these things pertain unto life itself. Okay, enough preaching. I was not supposed to do that. But the point that he is trying to make, what the creation of the world testifies to God's power, his nature, that God is. And notice what it says, having been clearly seen. And there are operative words, two operative words here. Nor u mina and katharita. The reason for these words is it has to do with the intellect. That's the thing. Things that are discernible of the mind intellectually. So what is he saying? True science true intellectual discovery and true intellectual objectivity tells you that this world could not come about from some stupid big bang. There is order. There is someone, something great who has done these things in this way. And intellectually, if you are truly intellectually honest, the creation itself says all of this stuff could not come about of itself. There has to be someone to have done these things. And God has left creation as a witness. And so, and it is clearly understood. So therefore they are, I like this when it says without excuse, that word is unapologetus. And the word apologia from anapologetus means defense. So they are the unbelieving world is without defense. 
What do you mean they are without defense? God has given proof of his existence. Notice verse number 18 and 19 internally. God has made it evident within them inside of every man is a simplistic knowledge of God that there is a God. And then when we look at the greatness, the complexities and the orderliness of the created universe itself, the universe testifies that there is a God. So therefore having evidence both what within and without, because there are only two things inside and outside. And when you bring together inside and outside, you say what everything having these things, it leaves unbelieving mankind without any defense. You cannot defend any fact and say there is no God. Why? Because inside of you, you know it's a God. Outside of you, you can tell there must be a God. But yet, and here's the point that Paul is trying to drive home. With all of this evidence inside and outside given by God, they still reject him. They still denounce him and they suppress the truth of the knowledge of of God. They don't want it to be a God because it leaves them free to pursue their own desires. And that's the bottom line. But anyway, let's go back on to the text. So what? And that brings us to the understanding of verse number 21 and continuing for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Uh, professing to be wise, they became fools, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now, let me stop there. So what? Again, he's saying, they knew God, they knew God, but did not honor God. Now, notice that Paul is not giving them a particular time and place. It seems that he has something in mind, even though they, they who knew God. Remember what I told you is moving from uh, the sense of humanity as a whole to Gentiles specifically. And then at the end of uh, when we get into chapter two, he's going to start dealing with the Jew. And that's why he's going to be able to say in chapter three, both Jew and Gentile are sinners. OK, so here he's dealing with the sense of Gentiles are sinners. But the point that I'm talking about here is it seems that he has a particular time in world history uh, 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 that he's referring to. And if I had to speculate, and I think that I'm right because it fits exactly the context of what Apostle Paul is talking about. I think he's talking about the post diluvian period after the flood for what very quickly, let's do this very quickly for we find that God was displeased with humanity because of wickedness, Genesis chapter six. And then God had made determination to destroy humanity, but nevertheless, he gave the world a period of grace of 120 years, whereby Noah preached the gospel according to first Peter, Noah preached the gospel to that unbelieving world. The unbelieving world still rejected God. They did not believe the gospel preached by Noah because had they believed they would have gotten onto the boat and they would have avoided the wrath of God that was coming upon the world, the great flood. But after the flood, what do we find? We find who was saved, Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. And no doubt they told of the story of God's judgment upon humanity because of the humanity's rejection of God, humanity's sin. They told of these things. That's in Genesis chapter nine. But what do we see? From these three sons is the explosion of the families of the earth. And as men began to populate, that's now moving into chapter 10. And as they began to populate upon the earth, you know that they would tell the first generation how much more that how much more the first generation will be aware of God and his judgments. They would know God. And you can see how this would be declining as the generations would come from one to a next. And the population began to expand, expand with the families of the earth until we get into Genesis chapter 11. And who do we see? Nimrod. 
God. And we see this instance of the Tower of Babel. And what do we see? God had said he had blessed the world and commanded the world to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and spread on the whole face of the earth and replenish. But what happened? Man in his disobedience, man built a ziggurat. He built a tower to worship the stars of heaven. He knew God. His forefathers told him of God, but he rejected God and he began to make other things and worship other things as God. God. Nimrod sets himself up as the mighty hunter of men, as one who is to be God in the first figure of the Antichrist. Okay, enough of that. I can't do that. But that's the point. So it seems that he refers to this age when men knew, but yet men began to reject God. All right, now let's get back more explicitly to the exegesis of the text. They knew him. They didn't honor him as God. So notice they knew God. They knew him even from the, 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 the post diluvian age that is after the flood. You, you know, they knew no knew. No one knew his sons knew you just got off the boat. And don't you know, they had children. Don't they told them they knew. But what as the generations would come, uh, people began to reject God. Why? Because in knowing God, there is this natural uh, inheritance thought that if there is truly a God and I am God's creature, I am indebted to God. I am made by God. So thus I must do, I have an obligation to do what God has made me to do. And we know what God has made us to do, that we might be righteous people, that we might live holy before him. But what does the unbeliever say? I don't want to do that. I want to live like I want to live. I want to lie. I want to steal. I want to cheat. I want to adult to commit adultery. I want to do all of this. So what? I have to say there is no God. I must set myself free of God. Why? Because if I'm free of God, I'm free of any obligations to God. But let's go back to the text. They knew God. They didn't honor him as God. They became futile, foolish, vain in their speculations and what their foolish heart was darkened. They were already foolish in rejecting God, but in their rejecting God, they became even more foolish and their hearts became even more darkened. And notice verse number 22. I like that. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And we see that today with all of the intellectuals in colleges and universities, all those who say that there is no God or they don't know whether there is a God, but they have all of this education. But in the furtherance, in the expanding of their education, it has not given them the proof that there is a God according to scripture. The internal light that God has placed within them they are suppressing inside of them the knowledge of God, but what they think they are so smart. But in reality, when you say there is no God, you are not smart. You're a fool. Okay. And I'm not going to get excited and preach, but these are the main ones who think they know everything. But God says, when you say that there is no God, you are a fool. But what, what did they do instead of holding on verse number 23 to the true God, to the true invisible God? What did they do? They changed the, the glory of the incorruptible God. You see that word for incorruptible, after two, it means uh, the, the, uh, 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 the sense of one who cannot decay, imperishing perishable, perishable. That's the idea. And that's why they use the term incorruptible. One who does not perish. You see, because all of the things that he mentions, what they exchange it for, what man perishes, birds perishes, four footed animals perishes, crawling creatures, reptiles perishes. They exchange the glory of the imperishable God and they made themselves idols, idols of men and idols of animals. So the whole idea of this section is God is true and real, and he made himself real and known to men. He made himself known to men inside of them and by the evidence of creation itself. Yet men were determined to reject God 
and suppress the knowledge of God. And in this suppressing of the knowledge of the true God, they had to get their own gods. So thus they made gods, idols, false gods of other men and even of animals. And we can see this when we look at all of the Gentile world in all of its forms of idolatrous worships using animals. Remember, even the Pharaoh uh, were, as a man as God, the Pharaoh was considered as a God. And even we can see all of the animals that we saw. That's why in the plagues that hit Egypt, all 10 plagues were against the gods of Egypt. And God was simply saying, I, Yahweh, am God alone. There is no other God besides me. And thus the 10 plagues. And when I say the 10 plagues, the 10 plagues were a strike against the gods of Egypt. All right. But anyway, so what happens? The point that I'm trying to stress. So let's keep it in line contextually. The sin. Notice what I just said, saints. The sin is singular rejection of God suppression of the knowledge of the true God. That's mankind's sin. So now what we are going to see is God's response, God's response to a world, to a people who has rejected him, the response of God. What did God do? Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Let's keep going. Why? Why did God do that? For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So notice what he says. The response of God. Now, the reason why I'm harping on this this is a common error that we make today when we see, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to explore this in the text, the particular sins that we're going to talk about. We say God is going to judge us because of these sins. That's wrong. The text, the Bible says God himself has judged us in bringing about these sins because we have rejected God. So let me say it again. I want to be absolutely clear. And that's why Paul is going to say it three times. Notice, therefore, God gave them over. Therefore, what? Because they rejected the true God and created gods for themselves, God gave them over. So the response of God to people's rejection of him was to give them over. And what did God give them over to? Lust, lust of their hearts to impurities. And that word is a catharsion, which is uncleanness. And that word in almost every case is used to sexual impurities. And that's why he continues to say what? So that their bodies would be dishonored amongst themselves, sesta, to dishonor their bodies amongst them. Now, Paul is going to talk, he's going to uh, explain what he means by the dishonoring of their bodies as he moves to the text, through the text, but he's just simply laying a foundational statement here. But the point, God did this to them. Why? Because they rejected him. That's what verse number 25 says. Why did God uh, uh, turn them over? For verse number 25. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now, actually, in, in the Greek, it says, toi sude, the lie. That is the lie that the true God is not God. The lie that a man or an animal can be God. That is the rejection of the true God. And so what did God do? They exchange. He turned them over to this impurity because they began to reject God and serve creatures rather than the creator. Now notice again, verse number 26, it simply emphasizes the same reason. What reason? 
from verse number 25, exchanging the truth of God, that God himself is God, that you can worship other things as God, what? Rejecting God. 26, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Watch. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. I like that. Boy, I like that. But let's break it down. So what? Now he just simply goes to dealing once again. What is the sin? The singular sin rejecting God, the true knowledge of God. And what have they done? They're trying to replace God, exchange God for idols, whether that idol is the worship of a man or worship of another creature. But the fact remains, they have rejected God. So thus what? For this reason, God gave them over. Notice again in verse number 24, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurities so that their bodies would be dishonored. So now in verse number 26, he is defining that rudimentary statement that he just gave. How did God give them over to dishonor their bodies? In degrading passions. Again, the point, the point. These things, these sins are not reasons why God is going to judge. No. These things are the evidence of God's judgment. Notice again, go all the way back to verse number 18. What did he say? For the wrath judgment of God is already, remember I was bringing that present tense in, you guys thought I was just bringing it up for no reason, but the wrath of God is already present tense being revealed. The wrath of God here, stay in the context. For God gave them over. That's judgment from God. That's punishment from God. So what is the wrath of God? What is the judgment of God that he is giving to people who have rejected him to dishonor their bodies in all manner of impurities? Verse 24, further define that. Verse number 26, degrading passions. Paul what do you mean by degrading passions? Their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. For the women of them, metaloxon, exchange, tain fusekain, crasein, ace tain parafusein. They exchange the natural crasein, natural use of the woman for another for that which is unnatural. In other words, they, let, me, let me just go on to the men part because there is a parallelism with these two ideas. Women exchange the natural, but now keep in mind what he's saying. God gave them over to this. Who? God did. And 27, same way, men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire uh, uh, toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts. So in the same way, men with men, the natural use of the woman, taste the layers of the natural woman of youth, exe kathesan, they exchange these things and instead, what did they do? And te or say they burnt, they burned in their lust. That word, or rake say, they had this longing desire inside of them, an in, incessant sexual desire. Our tone is alleluia for one another. Our sin is ain't our saying. They had a sexual desire for men, men sexually burning in their lust for men. And then it says, Ten aske masune. They committed the shameless deeds they were doing. Carter, Carter Gazominoi. My pronunciation can be ragged sometimes. Carter Gazominoi. Carter anti mistion Okay, let's forget the Greek. Let me just do it. And what did they do? They burned in their lust for one another. Then they had this word here. 
uh, uh, Tain Oske Matsunane. This deals with the deed, the shameless deed. Now, what I want to bring about is this. Homosexuality, because clearly that's what it's talking about. The natural use. Women burn in their desire, uh, 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 abandoning the use of men, women for women and men for men, because what? The natural, fulakai, the natural use. Because when we understand, and I don't want to get gross, but the physical makeup of a woman, the think about how a woman is physically made, the woman and the man, how a man is physically made. And I'm talking about the sexual organs. Quite naturally, satisfaction only comes with a woman and a man coming together. But what happened, they abandoned, that's why he said the natural use is on God created the sexual organs of the woman and the sexual organ of a man to complement one another in satisfaction because only in the coming together in that way can there be real enduring satisfaction because this is natural. But what did they do? They abandoned these things and women began to try to uh, satisfy sexually themselves with another woman and men. And notice how he begins to really explore the language of it. Men burned in their lust. And that is that nasty desire that we see just wanting stuff. They're unsatisfied one sexual partner after another, even though they try to pro proclaim a monogamous relationships and all of that. No, you're a liar. You're a liar. You are burning in sexual desire for man after man after man. For this is the judgment of God. And notice committing that indecent act. And when he talks about that indecent act, he uses that, that it's a long word, but the point is shameless deed things to the, which one time men would be ashamed of things at one time, which would have been done in the closet. Now you are out with this. You are bold with this. You are just Oh my God, you just out there. You, you, you've seen men, how they act, that they ain't got no shame. They want you to know it ain't a woman that they want. It's a man that they want. But nevertheless, indecent act. Now, let me get to the rest of the verse. Receiving in themselves, receiving in their own persons, the due penalty of their error. And I like that too. And notice what it says. Here's that Greek. Katein artemistion. Now, Antimestion deals with repayment. You can see that mystion comes from the sense of payment. Payment, that is, they are now being recompensed. But here's what I like. Hain a day taste planes auton, that is, which, uh, 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 of which it is necessary for the error of them. I, I like that. Let me see. The error of them what, what is necessary? That is the a day comes from day, which means it is necessary. And that is of the era of them, the era, what in here toys in themselves, in their bodies, what Apollon Bon that is receiving. So receiving a penalty, receiving a just penalty for these things. So here is the question. What in the world is he talking about? The penalty. That's why I like that a day. It is a necessary penalty that they are receiving where, what in he toys in themselves. That is in their bodies for what, what is the context that he is talking about? Sexual sins, men burning in their lust, for one another and committing these indecent acts in a shameless way. And thus God repays them in their bodies. It is necessary. It is a penalty that is due for this type of error. What is the error? Instead of taking the natural function and usage of a woman and satisfying your sexual desire. And of course, Righteously, this should be satisfied in a marriage. But even so, if you commit adultery or fornication and it's still with the opposite sex, it's still natural. It's sin, 
but it is still natural. Why? A man is going into a woman, but no, what's going on? Women with women, men with men. And notice what he says, it's unnatural. And what does God do? He recompenses them. He pays them back. And how does he pay them back? A day. It is necessary. It is due. God owes them these things, a penalty in themselves, a penalty in their bodies, a penalty in their flesh. Now, let me make you understand it. And you call it gonorrhea. You call it AIDS and you and whatever, all these sexual diseases. Thank God I ain't never had that junk. <laughs> never participate in all that junk. But nevertheless, all of these sexual diseases that come out of divine judgment from God. So we see divine judgment in two ways. What? The divine judgment, God says, because they don't want to remember me and keep me, because they suppress me, because they don't want God. What? I now judge them. I judge them to do the things that are dishonorable in their body. And Paul goes on to explain that God gave them up. God judged them to be involved in all of this. What we call today LGBTQ plus IBC, AB, <laughs> whatever. All of this transgenderism, all of this garbage, all of these things evidence the judgment. So let me back it up. So what? Okay, okay. Now, before I back that truck up, let me just go ahead and finish it. And I'll come back to that point because Paul is going to hit it three times, okay? So let's just go on and then we'll come back and we'll congeal this thought together. 28, notice the language. And just as they did not see fit, they didn't want what? They didn't see fit to what? To acknowledge God any longer. Notice the sin is singular the rejection of God. What? Again, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And let me just work through this thing because he's going to simply talk about the plurality and the expansiveness of wickedness. But notice the point. Notice the point. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Well, what, what are you talking about? What things are not proper that God in his judgment gave them over to 29 being filled with all unrighteousness, all wickedness, greed and evil, full of envy and murder. And oh, don't we have a problem with that strife and deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers. They are theostuges. They are God haters. And let me tell you something. If you want to get folk upset, bring God up. People hate God. Let's leave God out of it. Let's leave God out the schools. Let's leave God out the prayer. Let's leave God out the football plea. Whatever you do, you leave God out. We hate God. Insolent, arrogant. And let me tell you something. We definitely see a lot of that boastful inventors of evil, disobedient to parent with arrogant. It's the lack of humility. And I've never seen a people who are so proud of themselves. Everybody is so proud. I'm so proud of myself. I'm so happy with myself. I love myself. Ain't not oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. Evil, uh, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. And whoop, my, don't we see that? For the first line of defense for any society is the parent. Why? For if a child will not be respectful to the parent, the child won't be respectful to nobody. He will not respect the police. He will not respect the teacher. But what do we have today? We have children killing parents, children beating and jumping on the teachers in school. We have children and people assaulting the police. And all of this comes for a people who rejects God. But I'm not going to talk about it yet. But listen, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And let me just stop there because I have much to say about verse number 32. But the point is, they have rejected God. They don't want God. And thus what? Verse number 28. That's what I said. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. 
you notice the singular sin. Okay, now I'll go back. Verse number 24. Therefore, God gave them up over to the lust in their heart. Therefore, God gave them over. God responds to the singular sin of what? The rejection of God. They don't want the true God. They want to suppress the knowledge of God. They want to go into something else as God. God responds and God judges. How did he judge? Giving them over to impurity. Again, verse number 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrade and passion. Why? What reason was it? 25. They exchanged the truth of God, that there is a true God. For the lie, there can be another God. Again, the rejection of God. And then verse number 28, and just that they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. So what is the point? The singular sin that he is dealing with is the rejection of God, not wanting there to be a God. And thus what happens? God in each instance, what did you see? God therefore judges. So what am I trying to say? They are not doing these things that is going into the sexual sins and sexual perversion, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, and all of this stuff. And then all of the stuff talked about in verses number 29 and 30. They are not doing these things and God sends judgment because of it. Mm -mm. They are experiencing these things because they are a people who are under judgment from God. So what am I trying to say? Calming down, because I want you to see it clear as day. Therefore, when you see these things budding and sprouting in a society, it is the evidence that that society that people, that nation is under the judgment of God. Why? Because when they get involved to doing what? Exchanging the natural usage, the sexual immorality, and all of this gone crazy sex stuff. Notice it says they didn't just simply do this because they desire to do it. God gave them over. It was the judgment of God. So what am I saying? Especially in this country, in Western society, in America, we see this type of stuff going crazy. It is just evidencing this nation is under the judgment of God. How do I know without a shadow of a doubt, America is under the judgment of God when you see these things? Notice God gave them over to the, what did God give them over to passions, sexual immorality, homosexuality, gone crazy God. So thus the point that we need to hold when a people reject the true God, God judges them and God sends this type of sinful behavior amongst the people as a form of, of judgment. And that's why Romans 1 and 18 says what? For the wrath of God is even being revealed right now. And how is the wrath of God being revealed? How do we see the evidence of that wrath? Take a look. Do you see women abandoning the natural use of women? It's going crazy with them. Men abandoning natural use, burning in the, it's going crazy. LGBTQ, gay parades, gay month and blah. And it goes on and on and on and on. These things becomes the evidence of a people and a nation under judgment. And then verses number 29 and 30. So let me explain that in a nutshell. If you had desired God, remember the whole point, they reject God. But if you had desired God, you would understand there is a God. I'm a creature of God. So thus there will be inherent in you. The creature will want to do the things that are uh, necessary to please his God. That would be living a life of holiness. But guess what? You don't want it to be a God. You reject the true God. And in rejecting the true God, fine. God says, you want to reject me? 
fine, then I will give you a world. Then I will give you a society that has the appearance of one that has no mean. You reject me. You did that. Now this is how I respond. My response is, you reject me? Let me show you what it is to have a world without me. You have all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander, haters of God. This is a world without God. And so what we see in verse number 29 and 30 is once again, the response of God because of the rejection of him. 28, as they they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. What? God gave them over. This is what God has done. Now let's bring it to a close. And although they know, verse number 32, the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. Boy, I, I want to hit that statement. I want to work on I want to work on that. They not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So now what does he say? Although they know the ordinance of God, hortines ta da kaoma toi the u I like that. Okay. Why did I go in the Greek? These ones ta da kaoma. That's what I want you to see. The righteous standards, because you can see the Kaya, which deals with righteousness. They knew the righteous standards of God. You see inside, just like I said earlier, God has put within them the knowledge of God. With this knowledge of God also has a simplistic view of the right and the wrong. They know the right and the wrong inside of them. What? They knew the righteous ordinance of God. Still, not only did God in judgment turn them over to these things, these things they actually did with enjoyment. They did with greediness of desire. They practiced the homosexuality of lesbianism and transgenderism and all types of sexual pervert. It's going wild. Man, I was looking on TV. I, I saw, barely saw, but they got something where people uh, are, it, it got six, seven, ten people in some kind of a family relationship. So I don't know. And everybody having sex. It's gone wild. They're loving it. They're enjoying it. But at the same time, inside of everybody, you know, it's wrong. You know it's wrong to lie. You know it's wrong to steal. You know it's wrong to commit these acts of sexual immorality, but yet you do them. Notice what it said. They, they know that inside, as they also have this knowledge of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. What is the rightful judgment of God? Let me just simply say the Eric Lee way to kill you. That is the judgment of God to kill you. The wages of any sin is death. But notice Paul is talking here specifically punishment on such grievous sins. You ought to be brought to the grave. But notice they know these things. But what is the problem? They not only do the sins, do the same, but they also give hearty approval of those who practice them. Now, I'm not going to even worry about the Greek at this time. But what is he saying? Especially because notice specifically he was talking about those sexual sins, dishonoring their bodies, natural usage of women and men. He really got into that. And then a world, what it looks like when you don't want God, you do all kind of crazy stuff. That's what he's talking about. Notice the explicit nature of the sexual scene that they are practicing, but they're enjoying these. They only, they know they not only do it and enjoy it. They give hearty approval to people who do it. So what does it mean? Again, specifically the sexual sins. You see folks with the homosexuals and stuff. No, 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 no. Don't bother them. Don't bother them. They ain't doing nothing wrong. God made them that way. Leave them alone. The homosexuals are a protected class. The transgenders are a protected class. The lesbians are a protected class. People get involved in all types of sexual. Somehow they are protected classes. Notice 
people approve them. Normally, you would see what? A rejection of such sexual behavior. Normally, people would be ashamed. Normally, they would keep such things in the closet. But no, this is in the wide open. It has public acceptance. It has public approval. And you dare not say a word against it. Now you tell me, does this describe America to a T? If a joker say he's a gay, you better not say anything against him. Don't go to Canada because if you try to counsel people in Canada concerning homosexuality, they actually have a law against it. If a person is, don't you say nothing. As a matter of fact, they have become so engrossed. And this is what we see in the school system. The very nature of the absolute corruption of the school system. These teachers, so they call themselves, spend more time in talking about being gay and sexual freedom and all of this perniciousness, the types of books. We saw that stuff, what was it, in New Jersey or wherever it was, all, but it's everywhere. And they're teaching these things to third graders. A third grader is eight years old old. They're teaching Johnny has two mothers. Susie got two daddies or something like that. Teaching homosexuality, trying to make it the norm. It is adopted and adapted through our government. We look at the, the Biden administration. The assistant secretary of health is a man who is going about dressed like a woman, a man who was formerly married with children, but now he is a woman and he is one of the biggest promoters of homosexual agenda, the LGBTQ agenda and transgender. He, not only do they do these things, they give hearty approval of them. So thus I said it before I say it again. I am absolutely convinced America is under the divine judgment of God. Why? For when you see these things, they are simply the outworkings of God's judgment. What did he say? God, because they rejected God. You don't want God in your schools. You don't want God prayer in your schools. You don't want God to, to pray uh, even in the courtroom. You don't want the Ten Commandments there. You see, they try to remove God from everywhere. Don't talk about God on the public scene or in the TV. A coach try to take his football team and pray on the field. They might fire the coach. They reject God. And notice what Romans keeps saying three times. Let me take you back again so that you won't be confused. Verse number 24, therefore God gave him up. God responded. Verse number 26, for this reason God gave them over. God responded. Verse number 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. God responded. Because they rejected God, God gave them up. And what did the judgment of God look like? Sexual immorality and wickedness gone wild. You can't tell me we are not under judgment. Okay, I'm done with that. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining me in that teaching and preaching in Romans chapter 1. Uh, let's give a quick summary. We pretty much have all the way through, but the whole point is this. We can see coming from Romans verse 1 and 17, the gospel, the need for the gospel to be by faith, believing in Jesus alone. Why? Because of sin. What's the reason for the sin? Men, this is the section that we deal with now, have rejected God. And this is basically the Gentiles he's talking about, but all the world as well. Men have rejected God. Rejected God because there will be, there's a necessary response to God. There's a response in obedience, response in righteousness. But they don't want to. They want to be free free to live the way that they want to live. So what must they adopt? Other gods. Whether the other gods be men or gods of animals, they adopt other gods. And what did God do when men rejected him? God gave them over. What, what, what do you mean he gave them over? Start looking at what they started doing. And that's when we see the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff. That's when we see the LGBTQ, the homosexuality, the perversion, the trans... 
but this is the evidence. God has done this to a society who says, I don't want you anymore. And so he made that abundantly clear three times in the text. And finally he said, but nevertheless, even though they are under the judgment of God, they still enjoy it. They love it. They do it with uh, 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 superfluousness. <laughs> That's the word that comes to my mind. But never, they, they enjoy these things and know that it's worthy of death. And God has already recompensed it in their bodies, sexual diseases. God has recompensed it, but nevertheless, they still hold to these things. Not only do they hold to these things and enjoy these things, they approve it. They publicly and refuse to do anything or to say anything against it. They heartily approve it. All right, I'm done. Thanks for joining me with that, guys. If this lesson has been a blessing to you, give it a thumbs up, the YouTube thing, and subscribe if you have not already subscribed. And if you want to support this ministry financially, and I'm asking you to do so, there are links in the description, whether through Patreon, PayPal, or Cash App, or something of that nature. You can support this ministry, okay? So join me next time as we get into chapter two of Romans, where Paul begins to prepare, as he continues to move in this legalistic argument, as he talks about now, he's just finished talking about the Gentile world being a sinner before God. He's gonna make a statement. God has no respect of person. He don't care who it is who sins against God. And then he gets into the latter part of chapter two and simply says, Jews, you too have sinned against God. To simply say, everybody has sinned against God. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. See you then.